So we've talked about story, and we've talked about bringing, you know, this, you have the story, you have the basic story, and then you bring in something from the other half of the quadrant, music or imagination. And we talked about bringing in music in the poems, for example, uh, My Father's Rage, and, you know, how he just brought in all the assonance and alliteration. Now, as we get more and more advanced, we'll start talking about things like meter, right? Not necessarily strict form meter, but an open meter. So how can you use the natural stresses of the words to add rhythm to your poems? And there's things like syntactical twist, for example, in Robert Frost's poem, Something There Is That Doesn't Love a Wall. And so it's like, there is something that doesn't love a wall. It's something there is. So there's a syntactical twist on Robert Hayden's Those Winter Sundays when he says, my father, Sundays too, Sundays too, my father got up early. And instead of saying, my father also got up early on Sundays. Sundays too, you enter the poem with that immediate stress, Sundays too. And then you pause after two and two is stressed. And so it's, that's just, musically, that's just so much better. So we'll, you know, we'll talk more in depth about things like that, but today we're mostly going to talk about imagination. And so far I've told you imagination is when you write similes, when you compare one thing to another. The, um, the birds hung on the power lines like clothespins. That wasn't great, but you know, it's okay, it worked, right? Uh, that actually sort of does work, the birds hung on the power lines like clothespins. Um, the squirrel ran across the power line like a trapeze artist. Um, I don't know why I'm suddenly stuck on power lines here, but in any, in any case, you know, that's simile, a basic simile. But what I want to talk to you about is other ways to have imagination in your poems. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about similes. For example, in this poem, I read a dove, and this gorgeous poem that is mostly similes, and your, your, your narrative is in the title, Silos. So you know what she's talking about immediately, that's your narrative, she's describing silos. But we're going to talk about other types of imagination. You know, in case you're not a poet who likes to write similes, or in case you want to add even more to your uh, imaginative side of your poem, and don't and you want to do even more than just similes. Okay, so Silos by Rita Dove. Like martial swans in spring, paraded against the city sky's shabby blue, they were always too white and suddenly there. They were never fingers, never xylophones. Although once a stranger said they put him in mind of pans, pipes, and all the lost songs of Greece. But to the townspeople, they were like cigarettes. The smell chewy and bitter, like a field shorn of milkweed, or beer brewing, or a fingernail scorched over a flame. No, no, exclaimed the children. They're a fresh packet of chocolate, dreading Mathbrook. They were masculine toys. They were tall wishes. They were the ribs of the modern world. Now, one thing I love about this poem. I mean, I love this poem, right? But one of the things that I want you to notice about this poem is that she doesn't just always stop with this is like this. So like, you know, this, the silos are like Marshall Swans. This, she goes on with the imaginative simile. They're like Marshall Swans in spring paraded against the city sky shabby blue. That's something we're going to bring in, I'm going to bring in some of Rita Dove's poems later in the semester and talk about her book, Thomas and Buell. And this is something that you will see how extraordinary of a poet she is when she takes a simile and just expands it and does so much more with it. So, the, for example, you know, they were never fingers, okay, in, in other words, they are fingers to some people, never xylophones, and then you have this but to the townspeople, they were like cigarettes. And then she layers that. She adds to that image of cigarettes, the smell, chewy and bitter, like a field shorn of milkweed. So it's not just they were like cigarettes, but cigarettes chewy and bitter. So that's something that she does. I'm not going to say she does that wonderfully. And, and I love the way she does that. And that's something I think we should pay attention to. Instead of just stopping with the image, we keep going. Because again, as I've said, People who read poetry love words. They love poetry. They don't necessarily want you to stop with the simple simile. If you are writing well enough, they will appreciate your moving on with the music and the rhythm and the further and further of the images. And they will appreciate the fact that you are indeed making a film for them. There's one thing poets have. You know, it's so much easier just to sit and watch a film, right? Because the images are all there. But something that poets have 
that film does not do yet. It gives us image, it gives us sound, it does not yet give us touch, it does not yet give us smell, um, and it does not yet give us taste. I imagine at some point in the future you'll be watching a film and they will pump smells through the vents. So eventually they will have that, hopefully, I'm kind of hoping they don't do that because some smells I really don't want to smell. I would just rather leave it in my imagination. But as of right now, we've got this. We've got, you know, cigarettes chewy, the smell chewy and bitter. We get to do that. Okay, so we have that over, over film. So this is something I highly recommend you do. And, uh, and something else I want to just mention is when you are writing and you're writing concrete images, okay, you're not writing abstractions. You're not saying, I, I felt sad. You're giving us a simile or an image for what sadness looks like or feels like. And something like 70% of the images you see in published writing are sight. So if you could push yourself to talk about the other images, to use the other concrete, tactile images, such as, what are they? The taste, sound, smell, and hearing. Then again, you know, you're writing even better poetry or even better fiction or nonfiction. Okay? So, but this, you know, just again, you know, like a field shorn of milkweed. And, you know, she's, and she's bringing in something else too. She, you know, she brings in a bigger world. When like, no, no, exclaimed the children, they're a fresh packet of chalk dreading math work. So now you can just imagine these children who are indeed, you know, they're, they're school children and they are just thinking about school and they're thinking about all their homework and, you know, it just brings in a whole world without having to write everything I just said. Because she's counting on you to be a smart enough reader that you can use your imagination and you can push yourself to see all of this. And then she just ends it. They're masculine toys, they were tall wishes, and they were the ribs of the modern world. So again, she's bringing in something bigger than the poem. She's not just describing the silos but she's bringing in something bigger. You know, the whole idea of modernity is being brought in with that final image, okay? Um, now this is a poem to a group of starlings. We've already seen Joel Bills to a Mockingbird on the, on the other YouTube video. Um, this is Joel Bills' first book, White Summer. In the middle section, she has 14 poems. They are all 14 lines long. What poem, form poem do you guys know? It's a, sonnet. a sonnet, thank you very much. So they are all sonnets, there are 14 of them, and they are all like this. To a spider, to a group of starlings, to a mockingbird, to a, I don't remember what the other ones are, but they're all like this. They all have this, what they are in the title, and then they go on with imagination. And that's the nice thing about this quadrant. If you are a poet of imagination, you can't go on and on and on. You can just write, you know, 100 pages of similes and just never stop. You can just, your imagination is unlimited. This is the idea of the quadrant. The right side of the quadrant is unlimited. The left side of the quadrant is limited. The, the left side of the quadrant is order. The right side of the quadrant is chaos. So these two are balancing each other. So the idea of making these 14 lines long gives it order. So at 14 lines, no matter what I'm doing, I'm going to stop. So form, sonnet, going to stop. So that's how this balances so nicely. And this is another poem that you would not know what it's about if she did not give you the title. The title is the story. The title is the narrative. So if you're a poet who really doesn't want to tell a story, if you're a poet who wants to hide your story, you really don't want to talk about your life or the life of whatever it is you're talking about, because you want to give us just enough that we can work with the poem and understand what's going on in the poem, but you don't really want to tell us your story. I'm thinking of, say, for example, the poet Mattel, who was writing in Italy during a fascist regime. You know, if you have some situation like that, you, you don't want your mother to read your poems and understand that she, you're writing about her, just as an example, that I think many of you can understand. You know, this is one of the things you do. You go with the imaginative side of the quadrant, okay? Tell a group of starlings. 
All day you've chased the nuthatch, the titmouse, the purple finches in the trees, and now you strut down the street like overgrown boys, raccoon coats hiding your matchstick legs, the sidewalk your grand runway, and your boys on newspaper boxes, little drummers playing buckets and pails, shoe shy men calling hustlers, shiny watches, the old shell game. Bird of midnight sheen, of oil and ink, of trash cans in the alley, you're my hard times bird, my hand's shadow. You swarm over the roofs like thought before it falls. You shoot from the furnace with the coming rain. Dirty stars, faraway flames. I see that wonderful final image. And that's something else I want you to think about. Ending your poems on an image. You remember like oranges, Gary Soto? He didn't explain anything to us. He just gave us that final image of the boy unpilling the orange against the gray backdrop of the sky, and he left us to interpret what that means. Try to end your poems on an image and leave that for us to, just to walk away with that image in our mind. And then of course you also see she used alliteration, far away flames. Um, do you guys know what a starling is? It's a bird. It's a bird. It's a little more than just a bird though. What, can you tell me more about the bird, starling? It's an invasive species. It's an invasive species. Uh, in the, in the 18, 1890s, someone who wanted to introduce all the birds of Shakespeare to the United States released, was it six of them or 12 of them, in Central Park in New York City? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know this part. <laughs> okay, so someone, out, I wish I knew his name so we could, uh, we could, uh, say his name and then we could all hate him. Um, <laughs> so, um, but it, it's easily Googleable, Googleable, Googleable. Um, he released birds, he released all the birds of Shakespeare. The starlings thrived in this country. When, you, when you're driving down the highway, you see like a thousand birds rise up from the fields. Those are starlings. And they are invasive. Uh, they've, they've taken over, they've, you know, killing the native birds. So, you know, I see starlings and I don't think to myself, I'm going to write a gorgeous poem. This is, this is the sign of a really great poet to me. You can look at something that I just absolutely hate and, and you write a gorgeous poem. You look at it from a different viewpoint. You know, yes, these are horrible things. So let's write a poem. <laughs> okay. And it is indeed, you know, it is this wonderful poem and just full. Just look at all of the similes, just piled on top of similes, simile, simile, simile. And this is a really fun poem to write. When you forget about the narrative, when you forget about the fact that they're invasive, and you don't think about that, but instead just write a gorgeous poem, that's really fun. And that's something we need to try to remember. You know, as hard, as much as I'm talking to you about craft, I'm talking about, you know, the work you need to put into your writing, you know, how you want to make your writing really great, you know, that's work. That's sitting at your desk and spending the time. But it also is fun. I think you know, even when I'm working on a poem, when I come up with an extraordinary simile or a wonderful line that's metered and full of assonance and alliteration, to me that's fun, but that's not true for a lot of people. So, you know, part of the fun then is just using your imagination and getting to pile on the similes and not having to think for a minute about the fact that these are invasive birds. Okay? So, something to, you know, try to remember. You give yourself permission to fail when you're writing you give yourself permission to write a bad poem, and you try to have fun. Eugene Scheifen. Eugene Scheifen? Scheifelin. Eugene Scheifelin. That's canceling. Let's Let's flame him. <laughs> okay. This is a poem by Yusuf Kaminaka. It's from his book, Dinky Down. Um, you and I are disappearing. This is who it's for. Um, do, you, do you guys know who Yusuf Kaminaka is? He's a, an incredible poet. He's also a very famous poet. So we'll perhaps bring in some more poems about him. So I want you to know who he is. Okay? The cry I bring down from the hills belongs to a girl still burning inside my head. At daybreak, she burns like a piece of paper. She burns like foxfire in a thigh-shaped valley. A skirt of flames dances around her at dusk. We stand with our hands hanging at our sides while she burns like a sack of dry ice. She burns like oil on water. She burns like a cattail torch dipped in gasoline. She glows like the fat tip of a baker's cigar, silent as quicksilver. 
a tiger under a rainbow at nightfall. She burns like a shot glass of vodka. She burns like a field of puppies at the edge of a rainforest. She rises like dragon smoke to my nostrils. She burns like a burning bush driven by a god-awful wind. Now, you've said you don't know who Yusuf Kamenaki is. Can you tell me what you think the narrative of this poem is? What is happening? What, what was the, the impulse that had him write this poem? And you can guess. There's plenty of guesses. Let's see. Is, is, let's see. Let's see if there's anything in the poem that gives us a hint. Okay. Girl still burning inside my head. So what is that saying? No, problem. <laughs> uh, that the action of the girl burning is past tense. It is past tense. Thank you. She's still, but you know, in memory. I think all of us know this, that something terrible has happened, something traumatic has happened, and it is so difficult to get those memories gone. So in what situations would you have a girl burning? Witch. You gotta burn the witch. Okay, in the contemporary world, in what situations would you have a girl burning? Although yes, that is certainly a good answer, because we did burn witches. Um, we still, do we still burn people somewhere in the world? I think we probably do. Cremation? Cremation, okay, but, but uh, let me ask you this. In cremation, the person is already dead, right? We hope. This is a great fear of mine. This used to be a great fear of people actually being buried alive. You know, before medical technology really told you you're dead. You won't be buried alive now because they suck out all your blood and put you full of formaldehyde. Don't have to worry about that. Um, <laughs> but that would be cremation. So let's, you know, if, let's say, I can see that actually. You know, let's say that this is his daughter and for some reason he watched the cremation. Some cultures do that. We don't do that so much in this country, though, this culture. Uh, so, so I can see that though. If, if he watched his daughter being cremated, then I can certainly see never being able to get rid of that image. But I, I'm thinking, let's see. The cry I bring down from the hills belongs to a girl still burning inside my head. Does it, a skirt of flames dances around her at dusk. We stand with our hands hanging at our sides while she burns like a sack of dry ice. I mean, you're right, that could be. She's already passed away, and we being the family, the people who loved her. Um, are there any other things it could be? Warfare? It could be. Napalm. Could be war. It could be napalm. Okay. Do you all remember the image of the, it was a very famous photo, I think it probably won the Pulitzer for photos, of the village was bombed and the naked girl was running, screaming. Okay, we all know this image, right? So that was napalm. Okay, so um, could it be that Yusuf Kaminaka is a soldier who saw a child burning and now can never get rid of those images in his head? The other option is a firefighter, right? Um, one of our graduate students is a firefighter in Murfreesboro and he wrote a very powerful poem about these two, these two men broke into um, an old paint factory, I think and were trying to steal copper, I think. They were trying to steal something, and the, the, uh, where they were trying to steal it, it very clearly said electrified, or don't touch, or something. You know, it said this, but they touched, and the electric arc went through. The one got away, he burned his hand, he walked through the hospital, he walked somewhere like an, a, a mile away, and they sent rescue, and by the time the, the police got there first, and when my, my student arrived, the police woman came out and threw up. He, he goes in there, the man's still alive but he's being shocked. His fat is melted in a pool around him. Um, they couldn't rescue him without electrocuting themselves. You know, they had called the person who, to come and turn off the electricity. He was in West Frankfurt. How far away is that? Over an hour? Yeah. yeah. It was like, you know, five o'clock in the morning, they woke him up to come turn off the electricity and watch this man die, and, you know, and trying to comfort him as he's dying. Yeah. He's never, he, he actually called me the next morning and told me about it. Uh, and then you know, he wrote this very powerful poem, which is online, I believe, it won the Illinois contest. Um, I think it's called At the 
DuPont Paint Factory, I believe it's its title, and it won first place um, in a contest that's just for Illinois residents. And it's a powerful poem, and in your, it's like this for me. It's a much longer poem. But this poem, and my student John Travelstead, his poem is narrative, you know, with lyric moments. This poem is all lyric, it's all imagination. Uh, and you are correct that it is napalm. He is a vet of Vietnam. Okay, so, you know, this is, you know, it's a powerful poem. You, you know, maybe he's, this is from his first book, his, you know, and it's surrounded by other poems in his first book that make it clear that he was in Vietnam. So, you know, maybe he doesn't need to make it clear in him, but it also the time that it was published and the poems that it surrounded, you know, people would know. Kiki Dao is actually Vietnamese for crazy, I believe. Right? And that's the name of the book. Um, you have dragon smoke, tiger. Tiger represents mm -hmm. Vietnam. So that would be eight. Yeah, this dragons are very you know, Asia. Um, yes. And then also, what was it? Um, Cat tails, uh, poppies. That's that was what made me think. Very good. Thank you. There, there were you know hints like that in the poem. You know, uh, if there had been water buffalo or rice. Um, there could have been a couple more hints, but I think there are, you know, maybe because I know the, I know Yusuf Kamenaka, for me there was enough hints in the poem. I like this, you know, I thought for a minute when he had, she rises like dragon smoke to my nostrils, he was trying to make a, a happy ending, but then we went on to the next two lines, so it turns out not to be a happy ending. You know, this, this idea that at least, you know, you have risen as this thing that is powerful, like the phoenix rising, right? But then she like she rises. She burns like a burning bush, which also is a wonderful image because it alludes to the Bible, right? It's biblical, and it's you know again this is an image, and we don't have to interpret this image, but we can, right? We can interpret this image as apocalyptic, right? This you know this is you know God is looking down on us and judging us and is. You know, it's like a burning bush, and it's a god-awful, god-awful wind that is pushing this book. I mean, it really does say something about judgment. But again, just like in Argus, you don't have to do that. You can read the poem and just, you know, absolutely love it for its gorgeous imagery and love it for how it is approaching this subject and not erasing the narrative completely, but erasing the narrative. And this is something that I personally have discovered. Uh, just in writing my own poems, is the um, if you're writing a subject that is really difficult for you, a a poem of extremity, you know, often are very difficult to write. You really have to, you know, dig into yourself. And I will admit that I have spent, you know, a lot of time crying at my desk writing some of my poems. My most most recent book, I still, you know, it took me almost 30 years to finish it. Uh, don't worry, it won't take you that long to finish your book. Um, and but you know, even now, uh, when I read it, just to, like to proof it before sending it off to the you know the final proof to the publisher, even then I just like have to go to bed, and curl up in a fetal position. So you know, some things are really difficult like that. And this is a way to approach a subject of extremity without you know destroying yourself. It, you know, you have the information, just a little bit of information, and then you go to your imagination, and you let your imagination give you this, this, you know, all this, that takes care of the problem. Uh, we will talk about more poems that do that in the future, but I think this poem, it is doing that. And I'm not saying he's hiding from the subject, because if you read Dickie Dow, you will see that is certainly not the case. But this is one way to give, to give the reader a break. If you're writing a book, and there's poem after poem after poem that just leave the reader weeping. You, you give the reader a breath, a moment to breathe, a moment to appreciate that there is still beauty in the world. And the fact that you're writing is proof of that beauty in the world. Right? The fact that you have enough hope that you're putting down words and trying to communicate to other humans proves that there is beauty in the world still and there is hope in the world still. People often talk about how poems are often depressing. And I'm not going to say that many of them aren't depressing, but there are. There's also the fact that the fact that you're writing a poem means you still have hope.
And there are fun poems too. Um, we're going to read one today, I hope. Okay? Uh, to a starling, to this group of starlings is a fun poem. Yeah. Okay, they're invasive. But the poem itself was a great deal of fun, right? To a mockingbird is, was a great deal of fun. To uh, What the Dog Perhaps Hears by Lucille Miller was a wonderful fun poem. Okay? But this poem, this is by one of our graduate students, Andrew McFadden Ketchum. And this is a poem, again, this is a poem that uses images. Not so much similes, but images. And the thing I want to impress upon you is how clear the poem is, even though there's no story in the poem. The story is in April 16th, 2007. And we will Google that in a minute, uh, unless you all know what that date is already. Okay? Tonight. Tonight the sun gutters down to its wick as daylight strains and refracts in scurls across the lake's wide water. Heavy rollers of rain heave in against headland and tree line, lightning in its slow white script to farmland and watershed. Still, I know so little of the rain that plays this lake like a snare. Time run thin through the sky's turnstiles, a season yawed and narrow in its scope as all the grief and shrift I cannot hold but do moves in from the north. What else can I say to these ball-peened hammers of distant thunderheads? What else of this lake most deep where the mud newt sups and the black leech dreams of swimmers and blood? If only I could drop into sediment and murk, so much lost of the heart's heave through amnion and the liquid wake and sleep, so much forgotten of the ocean's collapse and the skull caps crowning, the boom, the crux, the good steel bolt slid home in the flame. Here in these first few minutes of dusk I say, sunset you take too much. Sun having preened its spoke, last light departed into the west. Here tonight I say, land you leave us too soon. Sky bottomed out, the lake clicked shut. Okay, the writer. Is the writer happy or sad? Seems really obvious to me. Sad. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sad. You guys are just shy. Um, yes, very sad. And this is something I want to talk to you about. This writer does not say I'm sad. This writer shows you that he's sad by using the outerscape, the landscape in this case. You do this when you're writing poems or when you're writing your fiction or even your nonfiction. The outerscape is used to talk about your innerscape. So in this case, he has thunderstorm rolling in from the north. He has the, the lake being played like a snare and the ball peen hammers, so the distant thunderheads are hammers and they're pounding on things and you have, you have the leeches in the lake and the leeches are dreaming of blood. So, you know, if this was a happy poem, you would have blue skies, sunshine, ducks. Ducks are good, right? Rainbow fish, rainbow, rainbow fish are good, right? Um, so, you know, you choose the outerscape to describe your innerscape. Now, there are times when you could do the very opposite. For example, there's a John Loomis poem in which he's at the funeral of his father, and he says in the poem, it's a beautiful day, not the day for a funeral, right? So he, he admits that this is the wrong outerscape for what is happening in the innerscape. But this is very important because you don't want to use abstractions in your stories, in your poems. You don't want to have to tell the reader that you're sad. So what do you do? You use the outerscape and choose your description. So if, oh, this wall, what color, what color is that door right there? Green. Huh. Gray, gray, green. Pew, pews. Puke green. Okay, we're all depressed. <laughs> it's baby puke green or it's diarrhea green. <laughs> okay, it is, it really is, and it's been, it's got all these scuff marks and scratches at the bottom, and you can see the old, what, the, what it used to be, it used to be, uh, it used to be baby shit yellow. <laughs> um, 
So, you know, this is a depressed poem, okay? Now, what if I was a happy person and I wanted to write a happy poem? Hey, look at this room. It's full of learning. It's a wonderful thing, right? It's, I lie. <laughs> I say it's green, but spring green. It's the bright green of grass, trees, in the early spring, leaves unfurling in the sun, right? Avocado you lie. green. I'm sorry? Avocado green. Avocado green, yes. It's a good, a good healthy food. Okay, so, so that's what you do when you're writing poems, when you're writing short stories. You choose your, your descriptions. Now, this is a landscape poem. This is a poem that's using trees. If you're in the city, you do the same thing. Right, you have a, the neighbor's dog at the end of its chain howling. You have sirens rising in the distance. You have buses spewing diesel fumes. And those are negative, right? All right, but we can make that bus electric all of a sudden, and things are much better already. We can have the dog in the dog park prancing and playing frisbee. Boom, happy dog. Okay. So this is what you do. You choose your outer scape to describe your inner scape. And that's one way to avoid having to, having to use abstractions. Now, does anyone know what the date is? What was the date? April, was it by chance April 16th, 2007? Yes, yeah. February Okay. This is something the reader does expect, the writer does expect you to do. Google a word you don't know the definition of, Google the date, do I need to click on this, or do you know what it is? Okay, I'm going to do content warning. Okay, if you do not like images that are very uh, extreme and difficult to see, please close your eyes right now. I'll tell you when to open them, okay? Because when I, when I click on that, the very first thing that pops up is oh Virginia Tech shooting. Okay, now I'm going to... You can open your eyes again. Okay, so Virginia Tech shooting. Uh, Andrew McFadden Ketchum was an undergraduate at Virginia Tech. And this poem was written in response to that shooting. Okay, so, but you know, he's given you all these depressing images, you know, these heartbreaking images without saying any of that. He just gave you the date. So that's you know something to think about when you want to write a poem and you don't want to write, there weren't a lot of similes in that. I mean the Thunderheads became ball peen hammers, for example, but there weren't a lot of similes. There was, uh, the essence of alliteration was very subtle, but it was very much an imagistic poem. It wasn't story based, it was images. And the images told you what you needed to know about the situation. And then the narrative was right there in that April 16th, 2007. Okay? This poem is very similar in that it is an image-based poem. Um, to tell you how high the bar is, David Caphouse, undergraduate at SIUC. <laughs> Writing some really good poems. Um, Jeremiah for spring. And also this is something to think about because a lot of times my students tell me, oh, I don't have anything to write about. I'm just a, I just grew up on a farm 50 miles from here, did farming, that's it. And I'm like, well, guess what? You do have a lot to write about. You go outside and you look at that world that surrounds you and you tell us about that world and you use the extraordinary language to tell us about that world and we're going to love your poem. Okay. Most of you do have something to write about. Most everyone does. But if you feel like you don't, you still got the world and you still got these wonderful images that you could write. Most of David Camphouse's poems were very farm based. Okay. Um, for, consider the slag heap seeping below the county's tanned hide. Do you guys know what a slag heap is? Rachel, do you? <laughs> a bunch of like rocks that are like kind of like the throwaway rocks that you're not trying to get to when you're mining. Right. When you're mining, it's the waste, the waste mm -hmm. from mining. So this is uh, a big pile of waste. The, um, there's many, many times, I don't know if this has happened recently, but people have, these have collapsed, these huge slag heap mountains basically that are built, they've collapsed and 
come down on villages and just wiped out entire villages, just killing everyone in their path in the United States of America, also in Wales. This was a very common thing. I think in Wales it was that it came down on top of an elementary school. Uh, so now I'm depressed already. He didn't even have to say anything to depress me. All he did was consider the slag heap, and now I'm depressed <laughs> because because we as you know we know our history, right? We we know from this one word we know so much. We know the history of mining. We know we have just all this vast amount of knowledge. And if we don't, we have this wonderful thing that did not exist when I was when it existed, but it was not easily available when I was your age, and that's called a computer that you have to walk around with in your pocket. Um, you have the world's knowledge right there at your fingertips. It's wonderful. Um, so you can always just look up slag heap if you don't know what it is. Okay? So seeping below the county's tan hide. Just, you know, the wonderful sound, slag heap seeping. You hear that assonance? I mean, below the county's tan hide. So there's even, you know, he's not really saying anything about perhaps waste is polluting things, but you know, it kind of implies that. But you don't have to see that. You can read it and just enjoy it. Consider the slag heap seeping below the county's tanned high. Below the trampled pastures, the leafless beans, the very clay sighing as it subsides. This is summer leaching away. So this is, again, just images <coughs> and beautiful. You know, hide, subside. It's a direct rhyme, but it's hidden. So the, the hide is at the end of the line and subside is in the middle of the line. So it, it's not a rhyme that sort of grates on your ears. It's a rhyme that you just love because of the way it comes at you. And then you have summer leaching away. So you know you're placed. You know what time of year it is. Flood lit at shifts in the prison smolders like dawn on the horizon. So we have very much a series, you know, this, this place, and then we have more place, and this is something I tell my students, that when you grow up around here, you don't realize this, but when I moved here, I noticed certain things, and one of them was coal mining, there's a lot of coal mining, um, this, this is, uh, I mean, it's really a lot of history of coal mining in this area, and people don't think about that, there's one of the worst mining disasters happened here, one of the, uh, there's a lot of books coming out now about the strikes, the coal mining strikes that happened in the 1800s and 1900s. And one of the things you probably don't realize is the coal miners in this area were the first ones to fight back when the governor would send in uh, the police and the National Guard with guns. The coal miners in this area were the first ones to fight back. So that Mother Jones, Mother Jones, who was a big uh, instigator, she has a magazine named after her, she asked to be buried here in Southern Illinois because Southern of that. Illinois. I'm sorry, not Southern Illinois. It's, it's like close it's the, in that. It's it's like Jeff, Jeff Bigger's grandfather is buried there. That's, that's, yeah. that's all I know. Uh, Reckoning at Eagle Creek? Um, yes. That's such a good book. <laughs> yes. Um, Reckoning at Eagle Creek. Now you've been recommended a book by Lane. Um, it's a Union coal miner's graveyard that's somewhere in Illinois where Mother Jones is buried. She's buried with her boys. With her boys. She wanted to be buried with her boys. Um, she, the other thing, you know, I, there's a number of things I noticed when I first got here that I thought was really odd. Uh, one was all the prisons. You guys don't realize this because you grew up with it, but I've never been surrounded by so many prisons in my life. Um, that's one of the economic engines of Illinois, right? But it's not an economic engine everywhere, is what you might not realize. I was getting ready to say, where do you think that money comes from? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I think the university is the economic engine <laughs> where my money comes from. Um, but this, I mean, this is coal mining, it's prisons, there's uh, two, three, four mental institutions. Um, Shoot is the big one that I know about because I used to live in that area and my neighbor, both, both my neighbors worked there. Uh, Shoot was started after the Civil War for Civil War veterans with PTSD. But it's, you know, still a very huge prison. Um, low water bridges. You guys don't realize this, but in other states, they build bridges over the creeks, not through them. That's really odd. <laughs> oh wait, there's water. I'm supposed to drive through this? Are you kidding me? <laughs> and then the big one that's really odd to me is sundown towns. I mean, I was like, what in the world is going on here? Sundown towns. And, and an amazing number of towns around here are sundown towns. Uh, so that's, you know, this 
four big things that people from the outside notice when they first come here. And this is things, you know, if you grew up here, you don't think about it because it's, you know, it's what you grew up with. But there are things you can think about writing about. Okay, so, and he doesn't really write about the prisons, right? But, at, but he mentions the prisons. I had a, I had a student who, uh, what's the name of that uh, school that's up the highway and it's right across from a prison, it's community college? Red Lake. Red Lake Community College. It's right across the highway from a prison. And I've had students who come in here and they say they're from that area and they spent their entire life thinking, I have two choices in life. My dad always makes that joke when we drive by. Is that, <laughs> there you go, make your choice. Community college or prison. You know, these are your choices. I mean, yes, I think that's what people really, I mean, you grow up around it and this, okay, this is it, these are my choices. As like me, I grew up in the number one poultry, poultry, poultry chicken and turkey producing county in the world. Um, and I grew up very close to a slaughterhouse. My family worked in the slaughterhouse. My family, you know, grows chickens. Um, I grew up thinking, okay, these are my choices. Pick cotton, work in the slaughterhouse, uh, go to college. I went with the latter one. Looked like the easiest, really. Uh, easier on your back, anyway. <laughs> so, because those are back-breaking jobs. They really are. So. This is, you know, I grew up, you know, people who didn't grow up there are going to go, wow, what's up with all these chicken feathers when you're driving down the highway? Chicken feathers <laughs> are just flying up around you. And that's, you know, it's because the big trucks bring in the chicken, chickens to the uh, slaughterhouse, the chicken slaughterhouse. And the chicken, you know, the feathers are just flying, you know, flying everywhere. And think about, I think where I grew up was also the second biggest pig growing area in the world. So I was surrounded by pig houses and chicken houses and I threw up once every day at least, minimum, because I don't do smells. And the smells are pretty bad. <laughs> Which is why I don't want the movies to suddenly start pumping in smells. <laughs> it's not gonna work for me. Um, but I don't mind reading about smells. I think it's slightly different, okay? So, but these are the things, you know, that, that are going to be interesting to people who aren't here. They're gonna go, wow, you're writing about a prison. You're writing about your father having a job at the prison, which is a very common job, right? I know a lot of people who work at the prisons. Um, so, bleared headlights reel along the highway toward the sign, strobing a beat against the dark, slurred fog of empty fields. Overhead, night hops snag and pitch in the neon half-light. Inside, men drink beyond remembering the road's home. Crumbled blacktops snaking creed bottoms past homesteads, burnt or rotted, to chimney-framed wallows. They drive through flurries of cottonwood leaves fluttering like ash from the listing trunks of Baptist churchyards, the stained glass patched with plywood. The lane peters out into a derelict barn lot swamped with honeysuckle full of rusted mold boards and harrows that say in deep shadows, this is nowhere you belong. This is the corn belt in the age of AIDS, of erosion, whole histories gone in a wash of acid rain and crystal meth. How long until the mud blooms green again with the burn of anhydrous, until the soil shifts in slow sheets across the road? A really powerful poem. And there's something else I want to point out to you. I, I mentioned this already, but I'm going to say it again. Bleared headlights reel along the highway toward a sign strobing a beat. Reel, what a wonderful, powerful unusual verb, but not so unusual that it makes you stop and go, that, 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 that didn't fit. And somebody used the, the source a little too much. This one fits beautifully. Um, there's also you know, a lot of music in this poem, a lot of um, assonance and alliteration, and then just, you know, just basically it's a description of the world outside of yourself, which will work in a poem. It works in short stories, right? You have characters they're doing dialogue, something is happening, a narrative is happening, but those characters exist in a real world. They do not exist in a vacuum. You world build. This is world building. This is creating the world for the reader. So this is what this is, and then it's giving you, it's giving you so much more with just a couple of lines. My colleague Allison Joseph wrote a poem about Anna, which was a sundown tap. And that's all she said. You know, she was there with her husband, John Tribble. They were driving through, and she said, Anna, this used to be a sundown town. And then she went on with the rest of the poem. That's all you, sometimes that's all you need to do. 
You just give the reader that one bit of information. So here you have you know, the information that um, there's bars, there's, um, there's houses that have burned down or fallen in disrepair, the, the, the farms are fallen in disres disrepair, there's, you know, there's age, there's erosion, there's crystal meth, and then you have this with the burn of anhydrous, which is a really nice particular image because it's one of the things that people steal to make crystal meth. It's also something you put on your fields, right? It's for a fertilizer. So the farmers have it out, these big huge tanks of anhydrous ammonia in their fields, and people are trying to steal it. They have, you know, they have things now they do to keep it from being stolen, but um, it's also particularly good because there is a major problem with crystal meth in southern Illinois. That book, was it Winter Bone? Yeah. That was, that was not set here, but it was set uh, just... In Missouri, I think? In Missouri, which yeah. is our neighboring state, <laughs> just west of here. And it's very similar, a very similar uh, area, right? And what's the joke? Come to Illinois for the wine, stay for the meth? <laughs> um, it's a problem, but he doesn't talk about the problem. He just mentions it and then goes on. So this is a poem. You know, if you want to write a poem that, if you don't want to tell a story, you use the world outside of yourself and you describe it in a way that is just gorgeous with the music of the words. And you're going to write a great poem. And you know, again, world building. When you're writing your stories, you're world building. You're creating a world in which your characters live. And this poem, you're showing us the world in which these characters live. Okay? That's very important. You're basically, again, creating a movie. Oh, this poem was published in the Lowe Poetry Journal. That's a really great journal. So, undergrad, SIUC. <laughs> now, this poem, similar to the poem we just read by David Kaphouse, this is a poem by James Kimball, and this is hiding the story. We mentioned Mary Oliver the other day, and what, what was the line from her book? Uh, tell me about despair yours, and I will tell you mine. That's it. Tell me about despair yours, and I will tell you mine. And that's it. That's all you get. She does not actually tell you in that poem about her despair. Okay? James Kimball wants... The, he had Mary Oliver's book on him, and he opened it up and showed me that line and said, this is what I do in my poems. Um, I hide the story. You know, I don't tell you. Okay? Now, this is another poem that very much is based in concrete images. It's actually pulling together a lot that we've talked about today. It's pulling together using the outer scape. It's pulling together just giving us concrete images and describing the world that surrounds you. Um, and, I mean, there's a lot going on in this poem that has to do with meter, but we're not going to go into that today, but pretty much I think every line has five stresses. Every line has a different number of syllables. The stresses are not in a certain pattern, so it's not like I am, unstressed, stress, unstressed, stress. Uh, but they, each line has five stresses, okay? And something, the rhyme, the end, it does not rhyme, but it near rhymes. Lived, bridge, filled, uh, past, sank, shrank, husk, stuck. There's echoing sound that go down the poem. So it's not rhyming, but it's choosing his words very carefully and ending the lines on the words that, that give you an echoing sound going down. But this, this poem hides the story. It simply gives you um, images that if you read it one time, you think to yourself, what a beautiful poem. And the other thing I want you to think about is the poem is so clear that you think there's a story, but there's not. Okay, it is not a story-based poem. It's just clear images, which is what I want you to be doing in your poems. You know, you don't have to write a story, but you do need to give us clarity of image. Okay, so when I read a line in your poem, I'm not completely lost. There might not be a story, but I know exactly where I am in the world. So in this poem, it was the middle of the night. I know exactly where I am. I'm in the middle of the night. <laughs> and I had lived a long time with that country, with the hay rakes and rock paths and the beam bridge above the snake thick waters. It was the middle of the night, so far into the field, the deer began not to notice, 
the moons in the shallow bean row puddles. That's how dark fell over the road that led into town and kept us all from moving. Still, when the train passed, milk shook in its bucket and the earth sank in a little. So each year when the corn shrank back to stubble, the mud strewn with husk more than anything, silence grew tall there between the kitchen window and the shed's roof and the one note rust made in the stuck weather vane in the rooster holding north. Okay, so there's a few things I want you to think about. You're not at all lost at any point. This is just a, a poem describing the world but he very carefully chooses the images, okay? And he very carefully alludes to things. For example, it was the middle of the night. Now, we're not really scared of the middle of the night now, but not that long ago, people believed that only, what, devils, witches, ghosts, and criminals came out in the middle of the night. You had to be in at home once night fell. They also believed that's where diseases came from. They believed the germs happened in the nighttime. So if it's the middle of the night, it's a very scary time, okay? So it was the middle of the night. And then you have, and I had lived a long time with that country, that country. Now, normally when we write this line, we're trying to say I live in the country, right? I had lived a long time in the country. He says that country. Now when I first read this poem, I loved it. It's a beautiful poem. I had to read it a few more times and think about it. That country is alluding to James Baldwin's book, Another Country. Now, I know James Kimball, so I asked him if that was true, and he said yes. Okay, James Baldwin, Another Country, do you know that book? Yeah. Thank you, Lane. Um, <laughs> so, the thing about James Baldwin, when he says another country, he's talking about the United States of America. Okay, the United States of America is for certain groups of people, another country. There, there are two different economies, for example, right? There's a, it's a different country if you are a person of color, right? It's a different country if you are LGBTQ. Okay, it is a different country, and that's what James Baldwin is referring to when he says another country. That's what James Kimball is referring to when he says that country. It's a different country for James Kimball. And then he gives us, hay rakes and rock paths and the beam bridge above the snake thick waters. Now again, this is, okay, automatically you should know this is not necessarily a happy poem. It's, it's not a sad poem. It's, but you need to know that he's describing the country in sort of a negative way because the waters are snake thick. Okay, some people like snakes. Um, I like snakes actually, but these are probably water moccasins I'm just going to assume because it's Mississippi. <laughs> okay? Um, if he had wanted it to be happy, we'd be back to the ducks, okay? The duck splashing water, the fish splashing water, um, the sunlight spattered water, maybe not spattered, that reminds me of blood or something, but sunlight speckled water, how's that? <laughs> okay, um, so the fact that he chose this chosen snake thick tells us, you know, that's using the outer scape to give us the tone of the poem. So, you know, so far we have, now I don't expect all of you to know this when you read a poem, and I don't think, I don't expect you to think about this when you're writing a poem, because that's a good way to get yourself shut down and, get, and to make your little monkey brain, what is it I called it? <laughs> the shit committee in my brain that tells me to, you know, I need to get off this writing poetry kick because I'm no good at it, right? You need to shut that up, okay? And so you instead need to, you know, you give yourself permission to fail, right? And you write this poem. So you're not going to be thinking about this when you're writing your first draft, because that's going to get your, your committee going. Okay? So the thing, it, it was, that line break was one of my first hints that this poem is metered. James Kimball's notes not to, not to end a line on a to be verb. <sighs> You, you don't end a line on a weak word. You don't end a line on a to-be verb. James Kimball knows that. We went to the same school. I know he knows that because I know it. We had the same teachers. And Rita Dove, the earlier poem, was one of our teachers. Charles Wright, Gregor, okay? Um, so my, that was my first hint that something was going on that I needed to think about 
outside of just the words. Now, I don't expect, you know, when you read this poem, you know, this is just a gorgeous poem. And it's just like oranges. You don't have to think about it. You can just enjoy the poem. That's something you don't hear very often from teachers, but you can, right? But it was the middle of the night, so far into the field, the deer began not to notice the moons in the shallow bean row puddles. And I love the way the moons are not in the sky reflecting from the shallow bean row puddles, but they are actually in the shallow bean row puddles. Now I love that slight twist of perception. And this was the place where I really realized James Kimball was doing something with meter. Not to notice the moons. Because we would normally say the deer began to not notice, right? He twisted that so that I'm forced to stress not. So then I started paying attention to meter, but I don't expect you to do this, you know, and you know, until you really start writing, you really decide that you want to become a writer who's published, then I would think, perhaps you want to think about meter even in your short stories. And we will talk about that further, okay? But that's how dark fell over the road that led into town and kept us all from moving. Still, when the train passed, milk shook in its bucket and the earth sank in a little. So this is, you know, you've got, you've got one of those famous literary allusions to trains. Have you ever heard that saying, if a train comes in through a, into a story, something is getting ready to happen, either the train is going to pick up the best person in town and take them away, or it's going to drop off a stranger. <laughs> Something's getting ready to happen. And that stranger is going to, it's going to change the projection of the story. That's going to be the disruption that causes everything to happen. So now we have a train. It's causing strange things to happen. Milk shaking its bucket. The earth sinking in a little. Um, so each year when the corn shrank back to stubble, I love that. It's not, we're not out in a, on a tractor in the field harvesting the corn or cutting the corn. It's shrinking back to stubble on its own. You know, just again, a slight change of perception makes this poem work. Uh, the mud strewn with husk, more than anything, silence grew tall there. Between the kitchen window and the shed's roof and the one-note rust made in the stuck weather vane and the rooster holding north. That's a bit of an abstraction, isn't it? More than anything, silence grew tall there. Okay, so this is the first poem in his first book, Gate House Heaven. The book goes on to talk about a number of things. One, James Kimbrell living in Mississippi, smart kid in Mississippi, um, 1970s, I believe, when he grew up. What do we know about Mississippi in the 1970s? Pretty bad place to be a person of color. Yeah. Pretty bad place to be a person of color. Pretty bad place to be a smart person, I, I think. Now, of course, I grew up in the country in a rural area in the South, also. Okay, so, you know, I remember 1960s and 1970s, and I don't remember the, it fondly. You know, I remember one of the things I spent all of my childhood thinking is, the second I can get out of here, I'm getting out of here. And I always thought to myself, I'm going north. Why would I think that? Why would you go north if you're a smart kid? And you would escape. What does the North have? Okay, this is okay. This is denotation versus connotation. It's not necessarily true. What we it's what we think. Okay, it's not. It does not have to be a fact, but it's what we often associate. So you know, if you ask me which is harder, a rock or a stone, denotatively they are the exact same thing. But in my mind, a rock is harder because of the sounds. Rock, stone, has a nice soft sound, stone. It's also kind of stable, stone, stable. Um, somebody else is going to say, no, no, rock is fun because rock and roll. <laughs> stone is fun because you get high. Um, you know, association, rock and stone are the same thing, okay? <laughs> but associatively, you know, we have these ideas, okay? Now, especially, now this is way before you were born, but think, have you seen that movie? Have you seen any movies about the civil rights, um, Mississippi burning, anything of that sort? You read your history. Mississippi, 
burning. There's a movie about it, for goodness sakes. Okay? Um, associatively, we think of the South as not being as good in education. I mean, where is Mississippi? In the uh, kindergarten through 12th grade? I think it's like 49. Four. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. associatively, <laughs> it's 49. Okay? Um, if you're smart, you probably want to get away from that. Okay, and so you think to yourself, where I'm going to go, you go to, where, where do we think, not necessarily true, but where do we think the best education is, the best jobs are, I think also try to think 1970s. This has changed now, right, but 1970s, 1960s, 1970s, when I was growing up and thinking to myself, I'm getting out of here, what, where did you think you would go? You'd go somewhere, city, New York, Chicago, somewhere north. Uh, I mean, now you could go to Charlotte, it's North Carolina, that's the south still. University of Alabama, University of Arkansas, University of Florida, there are plenty of great universities in the south. There's plenty of great jobs in the south now, but try to think 1960s, 1970s, when, 1970s when James Kimball was growing up. Okay, so associatively, he's looking at this world and saying, I gotta get out of here. This is why he has the rooster pointing north. You know, for all I know, he didn't even have a rooster on his barn. <laughs> and for all I know, it wasn't, if he did have one, it wasn't stuck. Or if it was stuck, it was pointing west or east or um, south <laughs> or just wherever. Okay, but it's pointing north in the poem because he's chosen that image for a reason. Much of the rest of the book is about uh, looking away and trying to get out. Uh, the book is also about his father who had schizophrenia and um, was also, I think, an alcoholic. Um, he, is a, um, he was a veteran. He was in Korea. He worked with atomic bombs. Uh, he's dead now from cancer, as is both of James Kimball's sisters, probably caused by working with atomic bombs in um, Korea. But the line, more than anything, silence grew tall there. Now, I don't know if that's still the case, but it used to be the case that if you lived in a house that was dysfunctional, say a schizophrenic father, you didn't talk about it. Um, that line is doing that work right there. 